In the third episode of our workshop series in Philippine Institutions 100, The Life and Works of Dr. Jose Rizal, we will delve into the reasons behind Portugal and Spain's search for the Spice Islands and how the latter encountered the islands in the Philippines by tracing back into the Habsburg monarchy that bore kings who made world explorations possible. We will also tackle the predicament of state expansionism to the work of Miguel de Cervantes' Don Quixote, which influenced the writings of the Filipino hero Dr. Jose Rizal. The Nature of the Colonizers Spain is located in the southwest region of Europe on the Iberian Peninsula. The country's latitude and longitude coordinates are 40 degrees north and 4 degrees west respectively. Spain is bordered by France to the north, Portugal to the west, the Bay of Biscay to the northwest, the Mediterranean Sea to the east and southeast, and the Atlantic Ocean to the southwest past Gibraltar. The majority of Spain's national territory is located on the Iberian Peninsula in Europe's southwest region. However, Canaries Island, Balearic Islands, a few smaller islands, and the North African cities of Ceuta and Melilla are also territories of Spain. The Iberian Peninsula is located in southwestern Europe. Spain and Portugal occupy the peninsula, which is only separated from North Africa at its southern tip by a small strait of Gibraltar at the junction of the Mediterranean and the Atlantic. Its strategic geographical location was crucial in the Iberian history. During the Punic Wars and the spread of Roman imperialism in the Mediterranean, the peninsula was gradually captured by the Roman armies. When the Roman Empire collapsed, the peninsula was invaded by Vandals and Viscots, and a harsh Germanic kingdom was imposed on Celt, Iberian, and Roman populace, lasting over 300 years until it was toppled by a Muslim invasion from across the Straits of Gibraltar in 711. Behind the battle line between Christians and Muslims, small semi-feudal Christian states were developing, Portugal in the west, Leon Castile in the center, and Aragon in the east. They marched south in parallel columns until the disintegrating Muslim authority was confined to the small kingdom of Granada by 1248. It remained there for 250 years until Ferdinand and Isabella drove it across the straits into North Africa in 1492. Therefore, the main concerns in the early history of the Iberian Peninsula had been war and religion. An almost constant war between Christians and Muslims for five centuries had created a vigorous military spirit, an enthusiasm for an irregular and venturesome way of life, an ideal of religious solidarity that was easily corrupted, generating intolerance and fanaticism. Furthermore, the Castilian people provided great material for the pioneering work of exploration and settlement. The majority of the peninsula was a high plateau with a rather harsh climate and poor soil that created sober and sturdy people equipped with endurance and perseverance. Hence, the opportunity of wealth and adventure abroad is strongly appealing for them. Furthermore, the people's attitude also showed hardness that amounted to cruelty as well as certain lazy thinking which could explain their extreme commitment to tradition. During the 15th century, a stable monarchy provided the impetus for early Portuguese expansion. The Portuguese prince, Henry the Navigator, who dedicated his life to the growth of geographical exploration and Portuguese commerce, paved the path for unprecedented success. The exploration of Africa's west coast educated the navigators who went to the East and West Indies, and the administration of trade with Africa grew the colonial system of later days. In Spain, Christopher Columbus also sailed under the authority and financial support of Isabella, Queen of Castile. His exploration resulted in the discovery of New World, the Indies in the West. He initially appealed to the King of Portugal and also sent Bartolomé, his brother, to seek support from authorities of France and England. Portugal and Spain petitioned the Pope for a description of their rights and confirmation of their claims. On one hand, Portugal was eager to maintain its monopoly on African and Eastern exploration. On the other hand, Spain sought to expand their colonial empire. Pope Alexander VI gave his permissions to two nations, Ferdinand and Isabella, to explore and take control of all the previously undiscovered and barbarian areas of the world west of a line drawn north and south in the Atlantic Ocean. The Portugal then claimed the east part of the same line, validated based on their previous explorations and grants of previous popes. 
The creation of the Marquesan Bulls and the Treaty of Tordesillas marks the beginning of the Philippine history. However, no particular mention of an extension of the line or a division of the world was made in the Papal Bulls or the Treaty of Tordesillas. Due to lack of knowledge about the actual dimensions of the Earth and a general underestimation of its size, the fact that Spice Islands lay far to the east of India revived in Magellan's mind Columbus' initial goal of discovering the land of spices through the westward route. Treading its sinuous intricacies took 38 days, followed by a terrifying 98-day journey over a really pathless sea. The first land seen was a little group of islands known as Ladrones due to the tivishness of the inhabitants and a brief stop was made at Guam. Approximately two weeks later, Magellan arrived in the group of islands now known as Philippines which he called the Islands of St. Lazarus. At the time of the discovery of America, Spain had attained a high level of political and religious unity and made significant progress toward national organization. The two kingdoms of Castile and Aragon was unified by historic dynastic marriage of Prince Ferdinand and Isabella in 1469. The kingdoms combined their energy, ability, and resources to restore peace and security to Castile and to construct effective government agencies. This became possible through a royal absolutism, the establishment of the crown's unquestioned supremacy, which eventually spread throughout Spain and transferred to their colonies that prevailed for hundreds of years. One of the government institutions established in Castile was the Council of the Indies. The Council of the Indies, established in 1524, advised the monarch on colonial affairs. The newly founded colonies were Castilian rather than Spanish. They were administered as Castilian appendages, and the Aragonese were forbidden from trading or residing there. Although after Ferdinand became regent of Spain in 1506, the restrictions were significantly relaxed in favor of his own Aragonese subject. Based on the evidence of the Recopilacion de Leyes de las Indias, it was not until 1596 that the citizens of all other Spanish kingdom were legally granted the same privileges of immigration to the New World. Ferdinand and Isabella were the last of the Trastamaras. When John, their sole male successor, died in 1497, the succession to the crown passed to his sister Juana. But Juana had married Philip the Handsome, heir to Habsburg throne to his father, Emperor Maximilian I. When Ferdinand died in 1516, Charles of Gent, the son of Juana and Philip, received Spain, which he ruled as Charles I, its colonies and Naples. Charles also inherited the Habsburg possessions in Germany when Maximilian I died in 1519. Shortly after, he was chosen as Holy Roman Emperor, a title he held as Charles V, to succeed his grandfather. In only a few years, Charles was able to bring together the world's most diverse empire since Rome. When Charles stepped down from his position, his son Philip II inherited Spain, the Italian provinces, and the Netherlands. Philip was also king of England for a short time as Mary Tudor's husband. In addition, Philip II also inherited the throne of Portugal through his mother in 1580. Therefore, during the reign of Philip II, the Iberian Peninsula was ruled by a single monarch. During this time, the council gained independence from the Council of Castile and gained more power over Spanish possessions. Philip II controlled his numerous dominions through a system of councils, including the Council of the Indies composed of experienced civil employees in coordination with the Council of State reporting to Philip. In response to external conflicts, the council formalized its statutes concerning the propagation of the Catholic faith, which provided the foundation for council control of religion under the authority of the king. The system of colonial governance contained in the Council of the Indies was applied to the rule of the Portuguese colonies in Brazil and the Orient when the two kingdoms of Portugal and Spain was unified. Brazil owed the development of colonial administration to the era of Spanish control between 1580 and 1640. Until then, Portuguese crown had done little or nothing to establish institutions specifically for the colony. There was no colonial council or colonial minister of state in Lisbon. Brazil's administration was mostly connected with that of Portugal, and in America, new communities like the early English colonies were allowed to exist. In 1604, Portuguese Council of the Indies was established, with many of the same authorities, executive, judicial, and ecclesiastical as its Spanish counterpart. Yet for various reasons, it had never as much authority as the latter. 
Following the Portuguese independence in 1640, the new Braganza dynasty maintained the institutions that it had inherited. They were governed, however, with far less consistency and unity of control and even the council's recognized features were not respected by the king or his ministers, who frequently intervened directly in colonial matters and nominated or removed officials at their discretion. The World Explorers Propelled by gospel, gold, and glory, and supported by much improved technology, the two Iberian powers, Portugal and Spain, pushed through their ultimate goals to discover the rest of the world. With their accumulated wealth, political authority, and the support of a small economic elite, Portugal and Spain were able to fund several daring expeditions in the vast unknown, undiscovered seas, and untouched continents. The world explorers were particularly tasked to search for maritime routes towards the Spice Islands. Besides searching for spices, the explorers also have to find gold, silver, and silk and take part in trade by establishing pleasant trade relations with the kings or lords of the lands they encounter. Furthermore, the explorers were tasked to continue the crusades against the Muslims, propagate the tenets of Christianity in the newly found lands, and abide by the papal bulls and treaties implemented, that is, Portugal to the east and Spain to the west. Some of the major explorers that received royal patronage and support from Portugal and Spain were Vasco da Gama by King Manuel I of Portugal in 1497, Ferdinand Magellan by King Charles V of Spain in 1518, Roy Lopez de Villalobos by Prince Philip II of Spain in 1542, and Miguel Lopez de Legazpi by the second Viceroy of New Spain, Luis de Velasco, in 1564. Commissioned by King Manuel I of Portugal, Vasco da Gama set out on an expedition in 1497 to search for an ocean highway to the Spice Islands. His discovery of an old sea route from Europe to India did not only mark an epoch in the history of geographical exploration but also of commerce. It permitted direct and permanent contact and trade with the Far East. The Gama's initial journey accomplished the quest for Christians and spices and led to a several hundred years of European domination through sea power and commerce as Portugal took command over the seaborne traffic of India and Persia. Ferdinand Magellan was a Portuguese explorer who came from a noble lineage. Magellan first laid his plan to seek the land of spices by the westward route before the king of Portugal. However, Finding no opportunity for its realization, he transferred his allegiance to Spain in 1518, wherein he and his financial backer, Christopher Harrow, promised King Charles V that he would discover a new route, a shorter one, to Moluccas. The idea was that if Moluccas lie so far east of India, they are probably in the Spanish half of the world, and if approached from the west, it may be one for the Catholic king. On March 22, 1518, a royal mandate authorized Magellan to undertake their expedition of discovery. He and his crew were instructed to proceed directly to the Spice Islands and bring back a cargo of the prized spices. On September 20, 1519, Ferdinand Magellan and his crew embarked on the expedition with five ships, and in 1521, they anchored at Matan Subu by Bay. Although he did not live to see its final completion, Magellan was credited for masterminding the first circumnavigation of the globe by guiding a ship across the wide expanse of the Pacific, the greatest single human achievement on sea. He discovered the strait that links the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, now called the Strait of Magellan. Such discovery allowed Spain to claim rights to trade with the Moluccas until King Charles relinquished these rights for 350,000 ducats due to financial difficulties and pressure from the King of Portugal who was not satisfied with the given demarcation line. The Kingdom of New Spain planned to make one of its ports on the Pacific as the natural starting point. Roy Lopez de Villalobos commanded an expedition with six ships in 1542 to conquer the Philippines and set up a colony. They reached the eastern coast of Mindanao in 1543. 
However, the expedition failed as the Portuguese captain general in the Moluccas made several vigorous protests against the intrusion, asserting that Mindanao fell within the Portuguese demarcation and that they had made some progress in introducing Christianity. Villalobos left no permanent mark upon the islands beyond giving the name Filipinas to some of them, in honor of then Crown Prince Philip II, later King Philip II of Spain. Miguel Lopez de Legazpi led a naval expedition in 1564, 22 years after that of Villalobos. He was specifically instructed to bring back to Mexico samples of Philippine-grown spices and discover the return route to Mexico. He successfully established the power of Spain in the Philippines and laid the foundations of their permanent organization. Villa de San Miguel, later changed to Ciudad del Santísimo Nombre de Jesús, was the first Spanish town established in the archipelago and the pioneer permanent settlement in the Philippines. His chief pilot, Father Andres de Ordoneta, discovered the Ordoneta Passage on his return to Navidad via the Pacific. The discovery of the sea lane was subsequently used by the Manila Acapulco Galleons until the 19th century. Three Papal Bulls and the Division of the World, Intercetera, Treaty of Tordesillas, and Treaty of Zaragoza. Divine rights of kings was the dominant political and religious doctrine at the time of the Age of Discovery. Thus, the Pope, the Vicar of the Church, as well as the Vicar of Christ, had great influence over the rulers, who could only be designated as kings with the Pope's blessings. The Pope, overall, was a powerful actor in European relations. Papal Bulls, the official edicts issued by the Pope, were particularly decisive in colonial history, especially in expanding the territories of the two powers of the Iberian Peninsula. The papal bulls contained the assertion of the rights of Spain and Portugal to colonize, convert, and enslave. In the guise of divine will and holy obedience, the two powers were able to justify the subjugation and exploitation of peoples and cultures in the lands not inhabited by Christians. The bulls also ensured their exclusive rights to the lands and waterways they discovered, claimed, and exploited. The history of the Philippine archipelago is fitly introduced starting with the papal bulls known as the Intercetera issued in 1493, the Treaty of Tordesillas issued in 1494, and the Treaty of Zaragoza issued in 1529. One of the three papal bulls of 1493 was the Intercetera promulgated on the 3rd of May. This was a papal bull that introduced the demarcation line between the dominions of Portugal and the Spanish Empire. The Intercetera recognized all lands in the West recently discovered which are hitherto unknown and not under the dominion of any Christian prince to belong to the Catholic monarchs King Ferdinand II and Queen Isabella I. The third papal bull after Intercetera and Eximia Devotionis, which were both dated May 3, was also called Intercetera. This third bull was dated May 4 and established the demarcation line, which grants to Spain all the lands in the west and south by drawing a line from the Arctic Pole to the Antarctic Pole. The pole-to-pole -pole line drawn was 100 leagues from any of the islands commonly known as the Azores and Cabo Verde and all lands west of that line would be under Spain's claim, while all lands east of the line were under Portugal's claim. This was ordered by Pope Alexander VI for the non-Christian lands discovered to be converted to Christianity and also grants the countries and lands that would be discovered by their envoys on their side of the demarcation line to them and their successors, giving them full free power, authority, and jurisdiction over these lands. This papal bull also prohibits anyone from going to these islands without special permission from the monarchs. As you can see in the photo, the dotted line denotes the colonial demarcation lines between Spain and Portugal under the Intercetera. The Treaty of Tordesillas was enacted on June 7, 1494 by Spanish and Portuguese representatives of their respective monarchs. It was named so because it was signed in the city of Tordesillas in Spain. This treaty was made in an effort to solve territorial disputes after Pope Alexander VI 
Papal Bulls in 1493. The Treaty of Tordesillas modified the original boundary created in the Papal Bulls from 100 leagues of Azores and Cabo Verde Islands to 370 leagues west of the Cabo Verde Islands. Furthermore, it also stipulated that all lands discovered by Spain on the side of Portugal shall belong to Portugal and vice versa. Furthermore, a part of the treaty states that both countries within 10 months of the date of signing must dispatch two or four vessels in a joint voyage in order to determine and draw the exact distance and divisional line of 370 leagues west of the Cabo Verde Islands and settle possible disputes. The meeting point of the two kingdoms' vessels was at the island of Grande Canaria. As the treaty stated that the agreement must be sanctioned by the Pope, it was given confirmation on January 24, 1506 by Pope Julius II through a bull. This map shows the line of demarcation implemented under the Treaty of Tordesillas. The Treaty of Zaragoza was negotiated in the town of Zaragoza between Spanish and Portuguese representatives and signed on April 22, 1529. It aimed to settle the dispute between the two empires regarding the ownership, navigation, and trade of Maluco Islands or Moluccas. As stated in the treaty, the King of Portugal, King João III, must pay an amount of 350,000 ducats of gold with each ducat's value equivalent to 375 Maravedis in Castilla to Emperor Charles V for the rights over Moluccas. This came with the condition that the emperor or his successors may revoke this and reimburse Portugal with the full amount they paid. A pole-to-pole -pole line was determined to work out which territories were sold to the Portuguese crown. This line would be 201 half leagues or almost 17 equinoctial degrees east of the islands of Moluccas, dividing the Eastern Hemisphere. This treaty was then endorsed by Pope Clement VII. In this map, the green line denotes the colonial demarcation lines between Spain and Portugal under the Treaty of Zaragoza. The Habsburg Empire Under the motto of Austria as Imperale Orwe Universo, which translates to so Austria is said to rule the whole world, the Habsburgs ruled almost the entirety of Europe in a span of approximately 650 years. Sons and daughters of Habsburg monarchs, predecessors and successors alike, understood what it meant to carry the name. Due to their collective belief that they were born to rule and were destined to govern the universal orb, the Habsburgs made sure that their bloodline was thick and exclusive. This meant that just like other dynasties, the Habsburgs also engaged in inbreeding. The defects are evidently seen among the family's members and much more prominent than that of Carlos II who was born disabled and was ultimately the end of the Spanish Habsburg line. Additionally, this family practice also resulted in the most characteristic physical inheritance of the members, which is the Habsburg lip. Apart from that, the Habsburg have also expanded their influence and power through marriage. Son and daughters were married off to the powerful which further gained the Habsburg's accumulated wealth and lands. At the peak of the reign, only a few contemporary countries remained untouched by the Habsburgs. England, Serbia, Portugal, Poland, in between and more, the Americas, African and Asian territories, these were at one point ruled by the Habsburgs. And the amount of power and influence needed to forge such territory speaks volume of how indestructible this house was at their time. Undoubtedly, the House of Habsburg is unparalleled. Their ambitions are at par with their commitment and confidence to achieve them. The Four Key Dynastic Strategies So the House of Habsburg did not last for centuries for no reason. The dynasty was not a simple family that branched out and was lucky enough to survive. In contrast, the Habsburgs stuck to their tested strategies and cultures. After all, succession and ruling was their family's business. To ensure that the Habsburg monarchy continues to grow, four key dynastic strategies were utilized. They are as follows. First, succession, marriage politics, and territorial acquisition. Apart from the production of heirs and marital alliances, the continuance of family traditions and the preservation of the patrimonial territorial complex was strictly upheld. Furthermore, the Habsburgs' obsessiveness with their dynastic ideology is what separates them from other European dynasties and that which also makes them free from weakness. Each member of the dynasty knew their duty to effectively and safely pass on the dynasty's domains. Expectantly, 
The Habsburgs also married for territorial gains. Their pursuit for territorial acquisition was reinforced by political marriages. This solidified diplomacy with the neighboring regions and other royal bloodlines. However, marrying outside of the Habsburg bloodline did not come without a risk. Doing so made the dynasty vulnerable to issues of inheritance. This then led to another risk, that of interbreeding. The second strategy is legitimacy and loyalty. Legitimation supports the dynasty's right to rule, while loyalty building involves instilling a sense of allegiance in the communities that it governs. Blood was a criterion for legitimacy and unsurprisingly is essential to dynasties. And the third is the evolution of Habsburg governance. So the third dynastic strategy utilized by the Habsburg is the function and the image of the ruler. This encompasses the entire governance style of the monarch, both internal and external. These governance trends include but are not limited to patrimonial rule, the codification of law, the sovereign's legal authority, and the legal rights of the subjects, the Renaissance emergence of bureaucratic kingship, Baroque notions of absolute monarchy, the enlightenment demystification of the royal power, and the growing primacy of kings as servants of the state and the collision of aristocratic privilege with mass politics in the later 19th century. In addition, the court also had a significant influence in shaping the role and image of the monarch in terms of the court's rules, display, and cultural patronage. And lastly is the institutionalization of the dynasty rule. This is the fourth dynastic strategy with Britain which pertains to the administrative structures through which the Habsburgs exercised control of their realms. This spans control over the following aspects, such as the monopolization of powers of coercion, development of a professional bureaucracy, which is typically motivated by the need to extract resources to pay for the army, the expansion of representative and the consultative systems fundamental to governance. Through these four key dynastic strategies, the Habsburg Empire was able to run their course for six centuries as they were able to make their own systems work for themselves. The Habsburg Realms So the wealth and power of the Habsburg Empire can be clearly seen through their acquired territories from the 11th to 18th century. These realms are the result of political marriages, inheritances, as well as alliances. The Habsburgs and its relation to the Spanish colonization in the Philippines. So through the Iberian Union, Habsburg monarchs of Spain ruled Portugal under the lineage of Maximilian I down to Charles V and his successors. Officially recognized in 1581 by the Portuguese Cortes of Tomar, Philip II of Spain was acclimated as Philip I of Portugal. The succession of rulers are as follows. Philip II of Spain became Philip I or Philip the Prudent of Portugal by 1580. Next is Philip III of Spain became Philip II, which was also known as Philip the Pious of Portugal in 1598. And lastly, Philip the Fourth of Spain became Philip III, also known as Philip the Great, the Tyrant or the Oppressor of Portugal by 1621. It was actually during the term of Philip II of Spain when the Philippines was colonized by Spain. The Iron Law of Oligarchy and its Implications By the virtue of historical tradition, the Habsburg monarchy exemplified the Iron Law of Oligarchy as their primary state power. This means that true democracy is theoretically and practically impossible, especially in large groups and complex organizations as a result of this particular Iron Law. The Iron Law of Oligarchy is characterized by a pattern where all types of organizations, regardless of how democratic they may be, at the start will eventually and inevitably inevitably develop oligarchic tendencies. For instance, in choosing leaders, voters always choose an individual that has an advantage over other else and has the characteristics that are innate to him which makes him a credible candidate. This means that in organizations, there is still a hierarchy of people which makes democratic formations oligarchic sooner or later. Most European nation states were formed through coercive exploitation. According to Charles Tilly, the power of state-making goes hand-in-hand hand with the power of war-making, making both acts an organized crime. He further claimed that states would emerge from war-making, extraction, and capital accumulation, and these depended on the state's ability to monopolize the means of coercion. It is also through these activities that we can examine the Habsburg Empire's state-making. War-making is the elimination of rivals outside one's territories. 
The Habsburgs, however, were able to consolidate power and expand influence by forging alliances through political marriages. This can also be seen in the various titles, which refers to the governed houses or territories conferred to King Philip II, found in Blair and Robertson, 93, Volume 5, page 260. The extracting power of the Habsburg Empire is also evident in their accumulation of capital by means of outright plunder, regular tribute, and bureaucratized taxation. For instance, in one of the letters of Fray Domingo de Salazar to King Philip II, he stated that the Philippine island was abundant with provisions that could be bought by the Spaniards from the natives with very little money. Salazar further wrote in Volume 5, page 210, As for the first, Your Majesty may be assured that heretofore, these Indians never have understood nor have they been given to understand that the Spaniards entered this country for any other purpose than to subjugate them and compel them to pay tributes. Consequently, the coercive power of the Habsburg Empire is embodied not only in their organized military, but also in the way they have restructured the social order of their subjugated territories, enabling them to monopolize the means of coercion. The Spaniards establish saleable offices in the conquered territories in order for the Spanish crown to decentralize his control over the colonies, and even employed native chiefs to further surveil and exploit the people. Sociocultural institutions such as schools and church also became tools for colonial political and economic administration. The writings of Cervantes were often autobiographical, hence his characters such that of Don Quixote reflects his life, ideas, and environment. All Cervantes' past labors, his bravery in battle, his vigilance in captivity, his tribulations in earning a livelihood sink into insignificance even as they probably did in his mind. Similarly, we can find resemblance between Jose Rizal and his character, Don Crisostomo Ibarra, at the onset of No Limit Tangere. Ibarra, like Rizal, was an illustrado who returned home after studying in Europe. The characters in both Cervantes' Don Quixote and Rizal's No Limit Tangere and El Filibusterismo are symbols of existing phenomenon or people of that time. Don Quixote depicts the Habsburg Empire's expansionism. Don Quixote de la Mancha is Spain herself. The valor demonstrated in the books of chivalry fueled Alonso Quijano, later Don Quixote, to go on a series of adventures in Part 1, Chapter 1. In the 16th century, the Habsburg Empire was at its peak, with the rulership of Holy Roman Emperors Maximilian I and Charles V of House Habsburg. Maximilian I was dubbed by John S. C. Abbott in page 85 as one of the best of the rulers of his age, and that his ambition was not to secure for himself ease or luxury, but to extend his imperial power and to aggrandize his family. Likewise, Abbott described Charles V as ambitious as his grandfather Maximilian, whose foresight and maneuvering had set in train those influences which had elevated him to the imperial dignity. However, the failed battles of Don Quixote, explicitly portrayed when he was defeated by the Knight of the White Moon in Part 2, Chapter 64, represent the declining influence of the Habsburg Empire due to the occurring religious wars and the invasion of the Turks, among others, which ultimately led to the fall of the Holy Roman Empire. In the same way, Sisa is known to symbolize our motherland, beautiful Kayumangin Kaligatan, but whose children, property, and life were taken and exploited by the oppressive colonial rule by the Spaniards, which Sisa expresses in Olimit Tangere, Chapter 21, page 168. Dalhin na ninyo ang lahat ng inyong masumpong sa aking dampa, ngunit ipabayaan na ninyo rito akong pumayapa, pabayaan na ninyong mamatay ako rito. Moreover, Don Quixote, Nolimit Tangere, and El Filibusterismo were Cervantes and Rizal's response to the prevailing social order of their time in a way that these works contain the author's scrutiny of the circumstances they were in. On one hand, Cervantes exposed the filth as well as the fecklessness of knighthood. In Part 2, Chapter 74, Cervantes wrote, My sole object has been to arouse man's contempt for all fabulous and absurd stories of knight errantry. Meanwhile, Rizal bared the brutality, corruption, abuses, and injustices and inequalities brought about by the Spanish colonization through its colonial institutions. 
Rizal likened Dolly Maytangi rin to a cancer which he attempts to unmask as written in Sa Aking Tinubuang Lupa of Dolly Maytangi rin. At sa ganitong adhikay pagsisikapan kong si Piing walang anumang pakundangan ang iyong tunay na kalagayan, tatalikwasin ko ang isang bahagi ng kumot na nakatatakip sa sakit, na anupat sa pagsuyo sa katotohanan ay hahandog ko ang lahat, sampo ng pagmamahal sa sariling dangal, sapagkat palibhasay anak mo'y taglay ko rin naman ang iyong mga kapulangan at mga karupukan ng puso. <tinyo>